Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba Life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Voidware prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Okay, round two. Name something that's not boring. A laundry? Ooh, a book club. Computer solitaire, huh? Ah. Oh. Sorry, we were looking for Chumba Casino. That's right. Chumbacasino.com has over 100 casino style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. Chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. Full work limited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Handle with Care. Cancer and Beyond is a podcast that gives everyone and anyone a place to come and keep it real about their cancer experience. Welcome to Handle with Care, Cancer and Beyond. And we're back with another episode of Handle with Care, Cancer and Beyond. My name is Chris Donovan, the co-host and producer here with the amazing Carrie Madrid of thecareprojecting.org. And today we're talking to Pat Washburn, who lost her husband, Marlon, to breast cancer. Marlon passed away just months after being diagnosed, and Pat memorialized him on what she calls the Marlon Mobile. So you have to listen to this conversation. It's really good. And remember, men can get breast cancer too. So enjoy and go to thecareprojectinc.org for more information or carrymadrid.com to get a hold of Carrie. Hey, Pat, thank you for joining the show today. How are you? I'm wonderful, Chris. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you, Carrie. What's up? Hey. Welcome to 2022. This is uh, obviously Handle with Care, Cancer and Beyond. And today our guest is Pat Washburn, who uh, we're going to talk to her about her husband's story, Marlon's story. So, I mean, I guess just take it away, Pat. Yeah, Pat, tell us. Tell us. How it started. How yeah. how he found it? What were the signs? Um, those, is that enough questions to start, or do you want me to add a few more? That's wonderful. <laughs> yeah, thank you. You know, and and I'll tell you what, Marlon's story was just a little bit odd in the way that he found it because he's not actually the one that found it. Um, so it started back in I would say 2014 when his oldest daughter was diagnosed with breast cancer, and. Um, I told Marlon at the time, I said, you know, honey, your dad died with lung cancer and now your daughter has breast cancer. Marlon had been a smoker since he was a teenager. And I said, you know, you probably need to keep track of yourself. And his comment to me was, well, it's not like I ever need to worry about breast cancer. Oh. So he absolutely was not uh, concerned about breast cancer for himself. That was not on the radar. And You know, I guess I always assumed that a man could get breast cancer, but honestly, I didn't know anybody that had. And so when he told me it wasn't anything he ever needed to worry about, I guess I took him at his word. I never thought about it. Let me be honest. I never thought about it. No, never. I was diagnosed. It did not hit me. The question didn't even hit me. Geez, I wonder if men could get breast cancer until I was diagnosed and probably only because I have three brothers and I was worried about them. And so I think his response was probably pretty standard. It surprises me that that would even make you think that, you know, could it happen? Because it never dawned on me. Me either. I would have never thought about that. I didn't even know it existed until I started, uh, you know, meeting with Carrie, talking with Carrie in the past, you know, five years or six years or whatever. Right, right. That's So, so that was in 2014 and his daughter has, she went, she had a lumpectomy. Um, She went through chemo. She went through radiation. Today she is a survivor and she's doing very well. And um, 2016, um, we had both retired in 2014. And in 2016, um, Marlon had been, he was an avid golfer and he had been out on the golf course uh, five days a week. Uh, break of dawn he was always out there and he had a pain in his arm uh, his arm and his shoulder which of course being a golfer we both assumed he did something out on the golf course Mm -hmm. and it was bad enough to where he was sleeping in the living room and he was sleeping in a recliner he would sleep with his his arm up on a pillow because of this intense pain 
So um, Marlon was also a diabetic and he was not pleased with his doctor that he had. So he was needing to switch doctors. I said, you know what? Let me introduce you to the guy that I go to. See what you think about him. He was an older man. He was in his 70s. and The doctor was in his mm -hmm. 70s. And so I took Marlon up, introduced him to him. Uh, they set up an appointment. Marlon was going to go in and have his A1C checked. And I told him, I said, honey, while you're in there, talk to the doctor about that pain in your arm. Maybe he can do something about it. Maybe they can take an x-ray, figure out what's going on. So that was on a Monday morning. As the doctor was leaving the appointment, Marlon said, oh, hey, doc, uh, Pat told me that I needed to mention to you that my arm has been hurting me. <laughs> That's how he said it. Pat told me I had to tell you. <laughs> Pat told me. That's exactly <laughs> what he said. How would, many stories have we heard like that, Chris, right? I, I would have said the same thing. Yeah, yeah. my <laughs> wife told me to double check this thing. Yeah. I'm mean, fine. <laughs> right, right. And it was just an arm for crying out loud. Yeah. Anyway, so he came back in and, and, and Doc sat down with him and talked to him. That's the reason I love this man. And he has since retired. But he, he never hesitated to sit down and talk with you. We always joked about he would grab a pen and paper and start drawing pictures of whatever it was he was talking about. He was an amazing man. So anyway, he comes back in and he talks to Marlon. He says, you know what? He said, let's see what your blood tests show. That was on Monday morning. Tuesday morning, we got a phone call. Now, Doc talked to me because Marlon was so terribly hard of hearing. Ah. It, it wasn't always um, just something that he chose not to listen to. He actually was hard of hearing. So anyway, Doc was talking to me and he says, you know, he said, we got the blood test back on Marlon. And he said his alkaline phosphatase is elevated. I said, Okay. What does that mean? Right. Well, he said it, it could mean something with his liver, could mean something with his gallbladder. I said, okay, so now what? He said he needs to come in tomorrow morning and we will do an ultrasound. Okay. So we go in the next morning for an ultrasound and the pain was so bad in his arm that they called me back into the uh, room with him so I could physically hold his arm up in the air so the ultrasound tech could, could scan him. Wow. And I see, you know, I'm looking at the screen. I don't recognize anything. I have so much admiration for our ultrasound techs and anybody that can look at a screen and figure out what the heck they're looking at. Anyway, um, I see that she's got something on the screen and then I, I see she's measuring something. And I'm thinking, well, they're concerned about the, you know, the, the liver, the kid at uh, the gallbladder. She must be measuring something on that. And at one point she asked me, she said, um, has he ever had problems with his kidneys or his uh, liver? I said, nope, never has. Okay. So that was on Wednesday, Thursday, we get a phone call and he has six lesions on his liver. And that's what she was measuring. <sighs> he was measuring the lesions. And um, so then he was called in for uh, an MRI. And, you know, Carrie, you know how it goes. One test leads to another, to another. Yeah. Um, he, I don't even, it's been a long time since I've repeated all of these. He ended up with an MRI. They called him in for a, um, a PET CT scan. They did a combo because he was so claustrophobic and they didn't want to do any, they didn't want to put any more stress on him than what he was already going through. They did a bone survey. They, um, they did an open, they did the open MRI. They, um, they did a biopsy of his breast and also of the liver. They did a mammogram. Now, was that the first, I mean, how did they go from, hey, let's do this ultrasound and check your arm. And now we find this lesion in your liver too. How did it end up? I mean, well, they, they, they called for the MRI, the open MRI right away. Uh -huh. And the spelling of Marlon's name is M-A-R-L-Y-N. So quite often he is 
if they just looked at the name, they pronounced it Marilyn. Yeah. And apparently, from what I'm told, apparently when they set up the MRI for him, they had it set higher than normal on his body. And it picked up the, the chest, supposedly. Oh. That's what we're told. Okay. And, and it, it caught the mass in the breast. Well, thank God it did. Yeah. I mean, absolutely. Now, you know, the whole story, right? Right. What was his experience with getting an, a mammogram? You know, I, I told him he'd heard me complain about it for several years. We were married for um, just shy of 23 years when he died. So he had heard me complain about it for several years. And I said, honey, you know, you got to know this is not going to be comfortable. This is what they're going to do. And I don't know if they, I don't know what they did to him. He came out and said, oh, hell, that wasn't bad. Now, you have to know my husband. I mean, that's just not like him to say that. So I don't think they, they gave him anything, but still yet, whatever they did, it wasn't as bad as what I had told him it was going to be. Okay. I compared it to possibly another body body part being put in a vice. <laughs> and that was just an assumption. That was him trying to be hard. That was him just going, nah, yeah. I've been complaining about this for years. Right. I got this. That's right. I was going to say that, Chris. <laughs> He's walking down the room. That was nothing. That was <laughs> and that could have been, yes. Yeah. <laughs> but no, he, he didn't complain about the mammogram at all. But they also had had done a bone survey on him. And I don't know if they had to do any prep work for the bone survey. I guess I would have assumed a bone survey was just some kind of a, an, an x-ray. But honestly, Gary, I don't know. Well, I've had plenty of bone scans. And bone scans, you literally lay on a table and they kind of slither you in to the tube, not like an MRI type tube, but, or it's more like a CT where it's just a, a thing that hovers over you very close to your body. And then and they push you in and then slowly you come out. And so it literally surveys all of your bones from head to toe. Is a bone scan the same as a bone survey? I've never heard of a bone survey, so I'm not sure. I was going to ask, I, is it multiple choice or is it true or false? What yeah, kind of survey is it? <laughs> never well, heard this, of a bone the point survey is, i mean either. the thing that that's standing out with me so far in this story is that this is all moving very quickly and the fact that all of these tests i mean usually it takes time to get these tests set up because there's a lot of cancer out there and there's a lot of people having scans and they take time some of these scans are 45 minutes to an hour so all this happens so quickly what how soon after the mammogram and all that do you get the diagnosis and what is the diagnosis well, you know, that that's honestly, that's all just really confusing to me. His first doctor's appointment was like the 26th of November. It was the tail end of November. So we went at the end of November, the first week in December. His birthday was December 7th. And we're doing all of these tests and, and scans and, and lung x-rays and all of this stuff in between. And... They had set up, uh, we had an appointment, they had never said the word cancer at that point, had never said the word cancer. And we were set up to have a port in, inserted, installed, what's, what's the proper terminology on placed. that? Placed. Placed. <laughs> he was set up to have a, a port placed. Again. But the they word, never said cancer? I don't understand. The word cancer had never come up. Of course, we knew that's what they were talking about, but, but they never actually said the word cancer. And at that point, we had never met with the oncologist. And when we finally did meet with the oncologist, would have, it would have either been the tail end of December or the very, very first part of January. The oncologist walked in. We knew better than to go to this appointment alone. I mean, Marlon was 66. I was six. I had just turned 60. And 
we've been through enough things to know you don't go into something like this without having somebody there that's going to listen and be your ears because you're sure as heck not going to hear everything. Yeah, you're going to check out at some point when you hear something that triggers you. Absolutely. <clears throat> so we had we had Marlon's second daughter, not the one that had gone through breast cancer. We had his second daughter and we had a daughter-in-law with us. And the daughter-in-law um, is a doctor herself, um, oh, okay. a pediatrician, but a doctor herself. So she was familiar with what was going on. Anyway, so we get into this appointment and the doctor, the oncologist came in, introduced herself and she said, um, you know, you have um, stage four metastatic breast cancer. Honestly, I had never heard metastatic. That I term. myself mm -hmm. did not know what metastatic meant. Mm -hmm. I knew stage four wasn't good, right? but as far as metastatic, I was clueless. Right. And, and she went on to say, you know, there is no cure. We will hopefully be able to give you five years and hopefully five quality years, but there is no cure. One of the things that, that has always stood out to me, and I tell so many people that they need to take someone else along with them. Mm -hmm. When we got home, of course, my daughter wanted to know, his, his kids wanted to know how did the doctor's appointment go. And so I'm on the phone and I'm telling them, you know, well, you know, there is no cure, but, you know, she's, she's hoping to give us five good quality years. And I got off the phone and Marlon was so mad. He said, why the hell are you telling people there's no cure for this? I said, because she said there wasn't. Bullshit. He said, she didn't say that. And I said, honey, she did. He made me call his daughter and our daughter-in-law to, to verify that he did, that, that he was actually told there is no cure. When he heard breast cancer, he shut down. He yeah. didn't hear anything. He checked else. out. That's the point yeah. where you just go into the want, 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 want is all you hear. And people think that's funny, but it's not funny. Oh, no, it is so true. It now, is so. Now, you've been you've been you, this whole story has started with Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. What day of the week is this now? Is this the next week? Um, no, we are actually probably because by the time we actually met the oncologist, we were about as, keep in mind, we had Christmas in there. Okay. Um, we had gone approximately a month. Okay. So, so from, from, yep, because we had the holidays and Marlon cooked dinner for 30 people that, that Christmas, you know, that was, that was our last family Christmas dinner. And he did all of the cooking. He was my cook. I miss that so yeah. much because yeah. he was my cook. And he never hesitated to try new things. But um, so we are probably about um, a month down the road. He also has already had the port placed. Um, See, Pat, you know, let me ask you this. Do yeah. you think that that um, aside from shutting down at that point and not hearing everything, do you think that Marlon was in a little bit of denial? Because oh, you, absolutely. And the reason I ask is because you go in for a procedure to have a port place. The port is there because you're going to start chemotherapy. So you I don't know think Marlon realized that. it didn't all click yet. I think maybe what he was thinking that brings me to another point. I think what he was thinking was if they have to give blood, if he has to give blood, if they have to take blood, I Easy honestly access. think that's what he was thinking. One of the questions on that very first day that um, the oncologist asked me, she said, have you noticed anything different um, emotional, uh, mentally with him? And I have to give you a little bit of a backstory. Marlon and I were married almost 23 years, but for nine years, we didn't live together. Right. I had our house in Iowa. Marlon was finishing his teaching career in Nebraska. We lived five hours apart for nine years. We both retired in 2014 and finally started living together again. I had noticed the difference in him. He was short with me. That day we were downstairs getting tables and chairs set up for Christmas dinner. 
he jumped all over my case because of where I would set one of the tables. Which was and I said, character. you know what? I said, you know what, honey? I'm going to go back upstairs. You guys go ahead and do what you want to with the tables down here. I went upstairs. My son-in-law actually came up and said, how long has he been that way with you? And I said, he's just, you know, everything that's going on, not a big deal. And, and another, another thing where I live here in Omaha, there is a, an intersection a quarter of a mile north of us. It's got a left turn light on the stoplight. We pulled up there one day, Marlon was driving. We pulled up there one day, the left turn light turned green, but the red light was up above it. And he just sat there and I said, honey, your light's green. And he said, no, it's not, it's red. I said, you've got the green arrow. He said, it don't matter. I've got a red light. Things weren't clicking. Yeah. yeah. I did not put that together. When she asked me if I, if I had noticed a difference in him, I said, well, other than the fact we're trying to get used to living together again, right? you know, because we hadn't lived together for nine years. Now, did he come home on, on weekends or you went there or did you yes. visit? Okay. We got together almost every weekend. So basically Either. for nine years, you got the best of him. Oh, absolutely. Right? You got the best of him. You didn't see absolutely. the everyday, like Chris and Evelyn getting on your nerves type stuff, right? Yeah. We're like, hey, I need a timeout. So. Yeah. Judy was boring. Hello. Then Judy discovered Jumbacasino.com. It's my little escape. Now Judy's the life of the party. Oh, baby, mama's bringing home the bacon. Whoa, take it easy, Judy. <laughs> The Chumba life is for everybody. So go to ChumbaCasino.com and play over 100 casino-style games. Join today and play for free for your chance to redeem some serious prizes. ChumbaCasino.com. No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. So I can see how you wouldn't put those things together because I didn't see that gradual decline, if you will. Yeah. 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 No, it, you know, and I always said, Marlon is a, I've always said, Marlon is such a smart man. He was in education for 41 years mm-hmm. and that in itself doesn't make him a smart man, but he, he read, he went to conferences. He was well-educated. Um, you know, he started out as a high school math teacher. He ended up as a high school principal and, you know, he, he was a well-educated man. Um, and that just speaks to the fact that, you know, if anyone's listening and thinks, well, how would, how would a guy not know he had breast cancer if it's that advanced, right? But did he have a lump? I'm glad you asked. Yes. That was another thing. And, um, did he know about it? Yes. Yes. And no. Okay. okay. Sorry. Um, and, and the reason that I say it that way is it was two and a half centimeters. Okay. When we were sitting there in the office and, and the oncologist touched it as she walked out of the room, I reached over and touched it. It was pretty pronounced in my mind. It was right under the, his left nipple and it was pretty pronounced. And I said, how long has that been there? And he said, I don't know. I don't know if I noticed it or not. I said, my God, if you're taking a shower, you've got to notice it. And he said, I've got other lipomas. If I would have felt it, I would have thought it was a lipoma. Right. And for anyone that doesn't know, a lipoma is just a fatty tumor. And they're very, very common. Very. Yes. He had other lipomas. Okay. And yeah. So so whether he noticed it or not, I, he doesn't know. He didn't know. So how did that appointment with the oncologist end? They set up a treatment plan for him. What was the treatment? They did set up a treatment plan. Of course, she she said, I'm going to step out of the room. If you have any questions, when I come back, I'll ask. And, and the one thing that I have, ta- Gary, you and I have talked about this. Anybody that I've talked to with, with cancer, we've talked about this. You don't know what questions to ask. You don't in that moment. You do. You don't have ever been through this. But do you have you any questions for me? And you're just sitting there like, uh, I just got smashed with a wave of information that I am now terminal or right. diagnosed for me stage three. Like, I'm still processing that. I don't even know what questions I'm going to have. Yeah. Right. Right. Hmm. So anyway, she came back in and she asked him how aggressive he wanted to be to fight it. In his mind. He was going to be able to go in. He was going to have a lumpectomy just because keep in mind the whole stage four metastatic 
did not mean anything to him. It didn't him. register. It did not register. Yeah. And so he thought he was going to be just like his daughter. He was going to go in. He was going to have a lumpectomy. He was going to do chemo or radiation or whatever needed to be done. And he was going to be good to go. Yeah. And so when, when she asked, how aggressive do you want to be? He said, I want to be aggressive. Okay. And I wasn't going to tell him anything one way or the other. I was going to be there to support him. Whatever he wanted to do, I would make sure that he got there and, and we would do whatever had to be done. So yes, they set up, um, uh, they set up a regiment for him because of the pain in his arm and his shoulder. They did set up uh, radiation to start. They, they radiated his scapula. Um, That's what I didn't ask. Wait a minute. We didn't, we didn't ask you. We, so where was the cancer when they finally all scans said and done? It was in the breast, but where else was it? It had already metastasized. It was in his liver, okay. which is why they right, did the right. biopsy there. It was in both lungs. Okay. It was in his lymph nodes. It was in his bones. And I didn't tell you this either. The last scan that they had him come in and do was a brain MRI. And he said, only if I'm put out. I'm with you okay, on that one. That's, that's fine. So I took him into the hospital. Um, I sat up in the room and when the nurse brought him back in and said, okay, we're all done. You can go down and get the car. I went down. This hospital is small. It's only, it was only two stories, maybe three stories. I, I went down the elevator, walked out to the parking lot to get the car before I even got to the car. His oncologist was on the phone. Mm. He said, he's got, um, eight tumors in his brain. So she started him on steroids, which on um, being a diabetic just really played havoc with his numbers. And uh, yeah, so he ended up with, it was in the brain also. You know, and I, I read the stories out there now of where breast cancer is so apt to metastasize to. And it, oh, my heart goes out to people that are going through this because mm -hmm. without realizing what we were getting into, man, we go right into the middle of it. Yeah. Talk about go big or go home, Marlon. Jeez. Head first yeah. without, without a swimsuit on. Like you, <laughs> you don't right? have been naked. <laughs> it, right. Um, it, right? It, it triggers me Oof. and I'm not making this about me. I'm making this about every survivor that's listening because we, we, Chris and I talk about this on the show all the time. One is, is there's two things. One is survivor's guilt. Like, right. So why Marlon and not me? Right. It's, it's silly to even think that way, but that's just, I'm just being real with you. So it's survivor's guilt for those of us, like I'm approaching 10 years. Right. And I'm so grateful. And it's stories like this that validates our fears of recurrence. Right. So it doesn't matter that I'm almost 10 years out or somebody may have just rung the bell and is a month out. Right. It doesn't matter. These, this is the reality of breast cancer. It is. This is the reality. Oh, I think it's over 30% of early stage breast cancers will become metastatic early stage. That's... I was stage three. That's not early stage. So right. I don't take one day for granted. Literally, I don't take one day for granted. I no, drive people you crazy with my big, bright ideas and executing as fast as possible, Chris being one of them, because, <laughs> and it's because I live with a sense of urgency. That's true. And I know that Pat, you subscribe to that as well. You live with purpose and you live with urgency and you live with passion and you enjoy and relish in the simple joys. The simple I things do. like spending time like this, this is, this is what we do. We're trying to educate people, enlighten people, inspire people. But at the same time for us to, even though the three of us are on zoom, we're spending this time alone talking about something so life altering for you. I, my heart just goes out to you. Um, so let's move on. H how does the treatment go? 
How does his body respond to treatment? You know, he was, Marlon was always a big water drinker, which as you know, they always say hydrate, hydrate, hydrate. Well, all of a sudden he, he wasn't able to do that. And whether it was a, 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 a mental thing or whether he physically just could not, I don't know. Um, within about a month, um, I was doing all of the driving in the house. Um, he, he got weak. Um, we, uh, you know, we, I, I don't even remember for sure how many treatments he went down to. He probably had three chemo treatments, maybe. And his, the doctor said, this is it. We can't do anything more. As far as the radiation goes, um, the radiation itself went quite well. The scapula, when they, they radiated his scapula, he had instant relief. Awesome. He never had pain again in that arm. I am so grateful for that. Thank so God thankful. For that. Yeah. The, the tail end of, I, I said he had five um, treatments on the scapula. At the tail end of that, they also started treatments on the brain. Mm. They told him that they could either do, and Gary, you might have to help me with this. They could either do targeted mm -hmm. radiation on his brain, or they could do, did they call it? the whole, it's basically the whole brain. Yeah. I'm not sure how that, I'm not real I, familiar I don't with remember, it. I don't remember what the two options were. Yeah. He wanted to have the targeted. And he had, okay, but he so, had like eight lesions on the brain, right? Right. So it's hard one, to think if you have eight lesions on the brain, it's like, how do you attack of, that? One, well, one of them was on the orbital bone. Okay. And that was one that they were worried about him losing his eyesight. Mm -hmm which realizing, you know, if we would have realized how bad things were, that certainly would not have been a concern for us, whether he was going to lose his eyesight. I haven't said this yet, but I only had him for five months after he was diagnosed. So for as fast as things went, radiating that, that optical nerve would not have been a big thing. Right. But, but that one was quite large. He also had a quite large one on his brain stem. Mm. Oh. So, so they targeted the, the optical, uh, his optical bone. Um, they, they said some of them were very small. I don't remember for sure how many brain um, radiations he had. I, I don't remember that. But I know when they got done with everything else, they wanted to go in and do another brain MRI because they were by this time he had already started his chemotherapy mm -hmm. and they said that on occasion the chemotherapy will will I, I don't know how but it like it break works, the, the brain it, barrier it, it works its way up and he said that it could have have um maybe shrunk the size of the tumor on the brain stem Marlon refused he said I will never go in to that I get that I, I will never do a brain MRI again, unless they put me under. And they said, if they put him under, he would be on a ventilator the rest of his life. Yeah. So, so the, the um, tumor on his brain stem was never treated ever. As far as, as the chemo goes, um, like I say, he probably had three different chemo treatments, maybe four, and they were extensive. They were like six, seven hours, seven and a yeah. half hours that we sat there while, you know, while he was getting the chemo. Um, he was quite sick with it. Um, you know, the first day, I think, which is probably normal, he didn't feel horrible. But then after that, he... Mm -hmm he didn't go anywhere without a barf bag. Yeah. Um, we just, we just kept it beside him and, you know, he was on massive amounts of oxygen because of the tumors in his lungs. Mm -hmm. um, he had never been on oxygen before he went into the hospital in March. He was in the hospital four different times and he went into in such a short spirit, uh, short period of time. Yeah. You know, let's yeah. just talk about that. So at, at some point, the doctor said, this is it. We, we cannot do any more. How did he handle that? How did you all handle that? And did you then proceed with hospice and take him home? Or how did that go? You know, I, I, I don't think it ever registered to Marlon 
that there was nothing more that could be done. I, I really and truly don't think so. Um, at one point, he did call in hospice. Mm -hmm. And the reason that he did, um, and I guess this should be out there too. I had a granddaughter that was doing a destination wedding down in Florida at the end of April. And we had originally planned on going. That would have been, you know, the summer before that we found out about it. Well, he knew that this wedding was coming up the end of April. So he called hospice in. We called the kids in so they could all listen. And his intention, which I didn't realize until the whole thing was over with, his intention was, his thought of hospice was, I will go on hospice. I will die. She can go to this wedding. So he called hospice in in March. The wedding was in April, the end of April. And as the gal sat here and talked to him about hospice, and he was, you know, he was very uh, jovial and, um, yeah, you know, this is what I need to do. That needs to go to that wedding. And she looked at him. Her name happened to be Pat also. She looked at him and she said, you are not ready to go on hospice. Well, then after she left is when I found out that was his intention. He thought, I go on hospice, I will die, Pat goes to the wedding. So many people think hospice is the absolute tail end of life, and it's not. Yep, that's exactly what he it's thought, not. too. Yep. Don't, yeah. But do you think that the tumors in his brain were altering any perspective of, of Absolutely. Him? Oh, oh absolutely oh. yeah there were so many things chris that that as i look back so I was many gonna say looking back you probably now realize sense. yeah yeah you know carrie you mentioned his hospital stays um one of his hospital stays he was in for 34 days straight and of those and this is before covid thankfully thank the lord for that um, of those 34 days, I spent 31 nights in the hospital with I'm him. I'm sure you did. I'm I sure took did. care of him in there. And, I, and I'll tell you, part of the, the big majority of the reason I did that was Marlon could be a bit of a hard ass. <laughs> and I didn't want him. To that get sweet man's face. I wait, I rebuked that. <laughs> I mean, looking at the Marlin Mobile. Oh my God. Face, I rebuked that. <laughs> I did not want him to get busy with his nurses or his CNA <laughs> or so anybody because, and Marlon was always one if, if you need to go to the bathroom, you need to go right now. I knew he was not going to have time to push a button and wait for somebody to come and help him. Right. And so, I, I did everything for him. He was yeah. there because the nurses came in, gave him meds, checked his vitals. They were doing occupational therapy. They were doing, uh, you know, they, they were doing all of the therapies on him. But um, I bathed him in the hospital. I took yeah. him to the bathroom. I cleaned him up. I did everything. Let me tell you how, from a patient's perspective, how wonderful that is. I mean, anybody can listen to that and go, oh, that's great. But no, let me just tell you, I was in ICU for 12 days. And at some point, my mom and her best friend, Laura, came in, who I call my Auntie Laura. And, you know, my hair was just gross. I was just, you just feel gross when your hair is gross. I'll never forget the day that she simply came in and told my mother, hey, get me the shampoo, get that barf bucket over there, get that thing over there. And they literally, because I was bedridden, they shampooed my hair and just that little bit of care that the nurses just cannot give you is right. priceless. So yeah. I, I yeah. We have to wrap up, but I just, I know we're going to have to have you back on because I really want to dedicate a whole um, episode to caregivers and, and widows and widowers, because it's so important. I mean, the work that you did just helping to support him and take care of him in those moments. And you're an incredible woman. You are, you ooze love. We've met in person. We've hugged, we've, we've had dinner together. I love you. I, I appreciate you. I respect you immensely. He obviously loves you too, because it, to down to the, to the wire, he was like, I'm going to go on hospice. So she can go to his wedding. Right. Like he was thinking of you. Right. I know. Oh, and I would love to, at, at, at some time, maybe when I come back, share some stories that I have. Marlon visits me every day. I do want to talk about that. There is always 
something. I do want and, to talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And, we and will. He, he shows up a lot through my great grandchildren. Yeah. I saw a video about that recently. Oh my but God. Real yes. quickly before we go, um, tell everybody about the Marlin mobile because we, I've, I've got a wrap in about two minutes, <laughs> but okay. tell us about the Marlin mobile. So the Marlin mobile is, um, it is the last car that Marlin ever bought. It was a 2014 Dodge Dart. Absolutely nothing fantastic about it. (laughs) Other than now, it is my tribute to him. It is a moving billboard to my husband and to all men that they can get breast cancer. The side of it says breast cancer does not discriminate men too. Got a picture of Marlon on the hood. And on the back window, it says hashtag Marlon Mobile. Awesome. And I have driven it approximately 75,000 miles since Marlon died, traveling coast to coast, literally, to tell yeah. people that men can get breast cancer. Yeah. And you, I have heard from um, some of my male breast cancer brothers about the impact you've had on their lives, just pouring love into them and support around them and validating them. And, and that's huge. You know, it's huge. They're very important to me, Carrie. Yeah. You have made a, a, a tremendous impact on the world of breast cancer awareness for men specifically, but you. you've also supported me as a female. And I appreciate that as well. You are amazing. Well, I, I will simply. always support you. Thank you. Oh. We will and definitely Chris. have you back. And Chris, <laughs> <laughs> we love Chris. Chris edits well. <laughs> He's not crying because he usually can. Cry. No doubt. <laughs> Well, thank you, what you well, do for, for what you do, Pat, because, you know, a lot of men out there like myself don't know about these things until it's brought up and you bring starting a conversation by driving the car around does help. So uh, thank you for that. She's got thank incredible you, stories. Thank Pat has all, also been on a few other of our episodes. So make sure you go back in the list and and uh, listen to those. Yeah, we got a bunch thank of you for welcoming me. I do appreciate it very much. Absolutely. We'll talk to you soon, Pat. Thank you. Sounds great. You two have a great day. You too. Bye, Take care. Thank you. Bye bye.